Bienvenidos. Welcome, everyone. My name is Mariana. I am the author and founder of Mexico Relocation Guide, a website that gives you a lot of helpful tips on living and moving to Mexico. Um, I have a really great guest today. Her name is Kathy. We're going to get all into talking about Ensenada, living in Ensenada, retiring in Ensenada, uh, tips on maybe ways that you can avoid getting uh, scammed in, in Mexico and, uh, and a bunch of other things that will be really useful uh, for anybody who's considering moving to Mexico or particularly living in Ensenada. We're going to get started here in a minute. Um, we're starting about two minutes early and I want you guys to check out the comments because there's a free living in Mexico guide uh, that I put together. It's a 2022 edition. It has some information on the income requirements for residency. It has some information on some cost of living averages. Uh, keep in mind, it obviously depends on your lifestyle and where you actually rent a house or what groceries you buy and all those things. But it's just to give you an idea of what healthcare could run you um, and what types of rentals you may be able to find in different parts of Mexico. Uh, if you're new around here, and you've never been on a live stream before, the purpose of these live streams is to give you guys just somebody's perspective into what it's like for them to live in that city. So Kathy, for example, today is joining us from Ensenada, Baja California, which is the next state outside of California. And, um, and she's going to share a lot of her experiences now being in Mexico. But the purpose of these live streams is to do just that, give you guys as much information about what it's like to actually live in Mexico from an actual person's perspective. And um, yeah, welcome to the live stream, everyone. I would love for you to uh, chime in and let me know where you guys are watching from. If you're, if you're new around here and you don't know how to do that, there's a button that says live chat and you click on that. You can then ask your questions or you can tell us where you're watching from. I'm gonna ask Kathy some questions first and we're just gonna get the conversation rolling. And then I'm gonna open it up to general Q&A at the end so you guys can ask Kathy your questions too. So feel free and let us know where you guys are watching from. I see LJ is here. Welcome, Kathy, she says. Thank you so much for being here. Debbie's watching from Southern California. There you go. Almost neighbors. Thank you guys so much for being here. Denver. How's the weather in Denver right now? Moving to Puerto Vallarta in July, currently traveling in an RV from San Diego to Yuma, Arizona. Cool. Very cool, Louisa. Thank you so much for being here. Florida. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Delaware. Okay. We don't get a lot of people from Delaware, but I do recognize your name, Nina. So thank you so much for being here. It's beautiful in, in uh, Denver today. What's the weather like in Ensenada right now, Kathy? Oh, it's a beautiful day here today. Wonderful April spring day in the 60s. It's about 67 degrees right now. Uh, sunshine, just a slight breeze off the ocean. Perfect day. That's so awesome. That sounds like a perfect day. It's only 3 p.m. there, so you still have the rest of the afternoon to enjoy oh, yeah. that sunshine. <laughs> Texas. Yeah, we get a lot of people from Texas. Atlanta. Hi, Debbie. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Well, let's get started. As promised, we started, try to start as, uh, as punctual as possible. So thank you guys so much for being here. If you're just now joining us, my guest today is Kathy, uh, who lives in Ensenada, Baja California. And Kathy is going to share some of her experiences, uh, some of her tips, and she's also going to get to answer some of your questions, because if you are wondering what living in Ensenada is like, or living in Mexico in general, it's always great and always best to get it from an actual person's perspective who actually lives there, right? And so that way you can, you can share your knowledge, right, uh, Kathy? on what it's like to actually live in Ensenada. Why don't we start off with you just giving us some background into who you are? 
Okay, well, um, I actually lived in Ensenada back in 2007, 8, and part of 2009. So it was about two years and three months, I think. And it was during that time I got to know this community and I um, decided I kind of, it was on my bucket list that I was going to retire here. And now, you know, that was 15 years ago or a little more. And now um, here I am retired here. I, I made it happen, you know? So um, that is kind of who I am as far as my relationship with Ensenada, who I am as a person. Well, I'm a widow. I'm also a mother. I have a son who's in his 40s and I have grandchildren and um, and I'm a retired psychotherapist. My job in the United States was really specific to addictions. I was an addictions therapist and um, I did that for I would say about 24, 23 or 24 years. Um, and prior to that, I was a counselor, but I, I specialized in grief and counseling and loss counseling. So um, that was my work while I was in the United States. And mm -hmm. Now, you said that, you know, you, you had been to Ensenada since 2007. When did you actually move to Ensenada permanently? Um, about two and a half months ago so not very it's been fairly recent but, mm -hmm. but because i've i was already you know i have experience living here it didn't it doesn't feel like oh my gosh this huge adjustment that i have to make because yeah, i already knew quite a bit about and so yeah you've been visiting the area for over 15 years i and have you know i made friends and i about twice a year i would come back to visit them so yeah. So why Ensenada? Was that the only place in Mexico that you had on your bucket list of places to retire or did you consider other areas? Oh gosh, no. My I have had, you know, many friends who've done gone on cruises or trips to Puerto Vallarta or Acapulco or um um Or like other places, or yeah, in the south, of, plan, any one yeah, of those it, yeah. And I, I thought about all those. I even explored a couple of them, but um, ultimately, my heart was still here in Ensenada. And so, yeah. when I when I made the comparisons too, I have to admit it was a little cheaper to choose Ensenada versus uh, some of those other locations that are quite popular for retirement as well. And so uh, the cost did, did affect my choice as well. But I also knew people, if you have a, a support network somewhere, it's, it's a, makes it a lot easier to move there because you already have an established group of friends and acquaintances and people, you know, so. Yeah. You feel less lonely. You know, you, it's much easier when you have a community, you can, call a friend up and have lunch or dinner with them. And it oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Or they can tell, tell you, you know, just local things like, you know, give you their recommendations on mm -hmm. where to buy absolutely. certain things and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I, and community is the number one thing that we talk about um, in this channel about, you know, try to build a community as soon as you can when you move to Mexico, because it'll make a big difference in, uh, in your integration, right? Even if it is only other expats at the beginning, uh, just just to try to make some friends as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I agree. Um, now, have you been to other other beach areas in Mexico? Other beach cities? Um, up and down Baja California, yes, I have. Um, in fact, just this Easter weekend, um, I went with some friends, and we went down. Uh, passed down south toward San Quintin uh, in in Baja to mm -hmm. a beach, a small beach area that, that they were acquainted with. And we stayed there for several days and had a great time. So um, there are some beautiful beaches um, 
all up and down Baja California. And um, uh, right now, a couple of the beaches in Ensenada are closed. But that's due to some um, pollution issues that they're trying to clean up. So, you know, I'm sure that pretty soon they'll be open again. Um, I know that happens from time to time in the United States, too, because I remember even as a kid, our, my family used to take us to Santa Cruz. And <laughs> one time the beaches were closed <laughs> for the same reason. So, yeah, it happens. <laughs> it happens. It's temporary. Time. It's not yes, permanent. Exactly. No, not. So do you do you still see yourself always living in Ensenada, even though you've kind of traveled all over the Baja Peninsula? Like, what's special about it, if you don't mind me asking? Other than you have obviously a community there, but are, are there any other things that stand out to you that somebody who might not know anybody in Ensenada might be interested in? Um, it's a cultural uh, center. There are like uh, quite a few art museums here. Uh, concert halls. Um, they bring in a lot of um, artists to do things. They have a, a, I mean, the cultural, the culture here is, is amazing. And um, I think even better than some of the more well-known resort places uh -huh. um, that are further south. In Mexico, this particular community is very culturally focused and centered, and they will bring in a lot of, of, you know, I'll get to see artists from all over Mexico, famous ones. And they also bring in artists from other countries. And it's just a cultural center. It would be like, you know, the equivalent of like going to San Francisco in, the, in, in, in yeah. my home state of California. A lot of cultural activities go on in Ensenada. The don't go on in actually the more, um, the more famous uh, tourist visiting areas like Puerto Vallarta. The, the culture here is quite prolific. I really, that was certainly an attraction for me. <clears throat> yeah, that there's so many events and things to do that you could get out and, and explore. And, you know, probably way more inexpensive than San Francisco to do those on a regular Yes, basis. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, would you mind for anybody who is watching, I'm sure they're curious, you know, you mentioned that you kind of stayed away from these other more popular uh, expat cities because the cost was a factor. Mm -hmm. um, are you renting now? Do you own a house? What's, what's um, your situation? I am renting. Okay. Uh, because, and that's mainly because... Um, I am an American, so owning property is only possible with some uh, years, a couple of years of residency and an, an FAMA3, an FM3 uh, resident document that would, then I could buy property. Uh, it, it can be done without that, but you need an aval, and that's kind of a sponsor, a local sponsor. And while I do have several people that are, you know, doing that for me, uh, in my opinion, one should rent for a, a year or two at least before they make a decision to buy property because you might not like exactly where you chose to live when you first came. Mm -hmm. And as you're there and you get to know the community for a while, you might discover there's a location that you might feel more comfortable in, you know, or as you make friends, you might discover that more of your friends maybe live in another colonia or another um, uh, part of the of the city. So, for me, um, it made more sense just to rent for right now. Sure, sure, yeah, and I think I think that's great advice. I we recommend the same thing. At least living in Mexico at least a year, especially if you've never lived there before. Um, just to see if it's actually, if you're going to like it after a year, after six months, if you still like it, if you still like it after a year, then I would say, yeah, then consider buying if you want to own a property in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, I want to clarify something because you mentioned the FM3 and that doesn't exist anymore. So I just want to oh, make sure okay. people, people right, don't, don't say like, what is that? Um, that's now the equivalent of a permanent residency. Uh, it is. Mexico. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Oh, no, no worries. I'm clarifying it for anybody who's watching because I'm sure they're going to ask me later, like, what is an FM3? 
um, that used to be the permanent residency visa years ago. But um, would you mind sharing what your cost of living expenses are on a monthly basis? Some people, it's the number one thing that they're wondering about. No, not at all. Um, my cost of living here, um, I, you know, if we exclude the fact that I'm still making car payments in the United States to, for my car. Um, oh, really? Yeah, I still am paying. It's a pretty new car. It's I bought it about three years ago, so Got I'm it. still paying um, on it. But um, uh, it, I was trying to calculate those up, and you know, it, it's it's a little bit less than a thousand dollars a month, and that includes my rent, my groceries, my water bill, my electric bill, my you know, for people who don't know, the, the water bill is just the water that runs into your house, but you also need to buy clean drinking water uh -huh. that, that you bring into your house in a, and put in a dispenser. And so, you know, that's another maybe uh, 10 or $12 a, a month. So, um, you know, that water as well, but when you add it all up, it's it's a little bit less than a thousand dollars a month for me uh -huh. to to live here and then when you add my car payment to it from the united states which i still have uh -huh. and i do have that uh car insurance in the united states and car insurance in mexico uh -huh. and i also have um i'm on you know obviously i'm a gray-haired old lady. <laughs> so I'm on Medicare. So I do have wise, uh, wise is what we say. <laughs> I do have a little bit of um, in health insurance I have to uh, pay for on my part B, D, whatever. Uh, oh, you have the supplemental Medicare. Right. So uh -huh. um, those extra, those payments equal up to another uh, between the car and the health insurance and, and that another, you know, 500 or so dollars. So, you know, you can, I, I actually can live here on less than about $1,500, $1,600 a month. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's coming it close, but it, it, um, it's definitely doable. And uh, I will say it helps if you speak Spanish, which I do because if you choose to live in the more close, Ensenada has three or four communities of Americans, but they live off outside of the city and they're kind of their own communities, English speaking and everything. And it, it costs more to live there. And, um, and so it, it helps to speak Spanish because then you can live in this city and, and enjoy the same, um, well, the same cost of living as the local people do. Yeah, of course. Now, um, what, like, what is your house like? So some people might be wondering, okay, so she lives on about, let's say that some people don't have a car and they don't have Medicare, so they can just, you know, assume that they won't have that expense. Um, definitely not like a lien on their car in the U.S. still, but assuming that they live like you, what's your lifestyle like? Like what kind of house are you renting? Um, you know, how um, often are you going out to eat? Things like that. You mentioned cultural events. So how often oh, yeah. are you getting out there? I live in a three bedroom house. Okay. It is a typical uh, Mexican home. It's, it's not made of wood. It's made of concrete. Sure. Yeah. Um, the walls. <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's it's comfortable and uh, it's quite large, I think, for just me. But I have a, a backyard. I have a front yard. Mm -hmm. um, and I have nice neighbors. <laughs> and, Very important. Yes. Yeah, so yes. I, I live in a um, you know, if you're familiar with Mexico, they don't have zoning laws like we do in the United States. So mm -hmm. sometimes there'll be three houses and then a business mm -hmm. and then another business maybe in a house and then another business and, mm -hmm. and they don't zone things separately. But 
my neighborhood, which is called Colonia Maestros, okay, is residential. And and I I other than a couple of guys that are two doors down from me that wash people's cars, you know, for um they, it's actually a business for them. People drive up and they wash their cars and and stuff. Um my for blocks, my street is all um residential. So that's really nice. So you avoid some of those like normal noises that would come with a street with a lot of mixed zoning, like mm -hmm, exactly. maybe having a mechanic next door or something. No, no, I don't. It's yeah. it's pretty quiet. I I I'm I feel you know very blessed that I found this house in this neighborhood. It's 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 only like a block or two from one of the main streets of Ensenada. And Ensenada itself is very hilly. It's not flat at all. Um, it's a typical um, uh, California, you know, whether you're in Northern uh, California in the United States or you're in, in Baja California in Mexico, you know, it's very, the, the coastal area is mountainous and mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, the mountains go right down to the beach and um, Ensenada is the same that way. So, my street is on a hill and it I can stand out in my front yard and I can look down a mile and a half down to the, the beach and I can see the ocean. Oh, that's and, great. And Sonata has a very huge bandera, the their flag, mm. Mexican flag, and it's it's gigantic. Yeah. <laughs> kind of a monument, right? Yeah, yeah it's one of the largest. Uh, flags in the country they brag yeah. about it too and it, it takes and you know, i think they do that for the people that are coming in on cruise ships like just that it is landmark, because it's right? located in the plaza that's kind of near the port by the cruise where the cruise ships come in so and i can see that flag from my front front yard so um so i really you know love where i live um it, there was another question you asked me but i can't how remember. much you know how much are you going out to eat just oh, that's like, right. Okay. Oh, I enjoy going out to eat. I consider myself kind of a restaurant connoisseur. A I, I uh -huh. a foodie, yeah. <laughs> and I, um, I have to say, Ensenada has some world class restaurants, and mm -hmm. I can't afford, you know, on my retirement income is very fixed, <laughs> so I, it's not like I can just do like I used to do when I worked and, you know, go out on a whim <laughs> and go sure. out. And, but sure. You'd be like, I'm splurging today. You, you maybe have once or twice a month I can go out and enjoy one of those places. And I, I'm really, I, I feel really blessed because Ensenada has a lot of really world-class food. So. But I in other words, I guess, I guess some people may wonder like, if I live on a thousand dollars a month, just assuming, right, that they, mm -hmm. that they have this budget, like, am I gonna be homebound because I won't have enough money to? And I guess what I'm getting at is that that you know that you won't that you that if you're smart about how you handle your money, you can yes. live amongst a local community instead of mm -hmm. being like in a private gated community where rents are probably double. Mm -hmm. um, you probably can go to some of the more local restaurants and still be able to get a really fantastic meal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and be in even a neighborhood where some of the action is happening, where you know you're probably a three minute drive to the beach, um, yep. or at, at least a three minute drive to where you know all the commercial retailers are and like mm -hmm. where shopping is and things like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would say that if people. Um, if, if you're an American wanting to move here, uh, you could certainly uh, find products that you're accustomed to because Ensenada has a Walmart, a Costco, Home Depot, it has a Petco, it has, you know, all the stores that, that we would have in the States, uh, pretty much, not all. There are larger cities in Mexico that have more of them. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not a large city. So um, it does have a handful of those um, stores with products that are, are that we are more accustomed to. But I, I would put a caution on that, mm -hmm. that, that shopping at those stores 
is actually more expensive uh -huh. because you're paying uh, import taxes when you shop there. So you will notice that you will be going into one of those stores and you will purchase something and you might be accustomed to it at a certain price at that store in the States and it, it will it will have some import taxes attached to it that you're not used to. So for yeah. me, I would just say my preference is to go, is to pa uh, patronize the local, the Mexican businesses more because yes. uh, and number one, it's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> number two, it's just as high quality. And number three, I mean, really you're not, you're supporting the local community without paying all the import tax and, I don't know, I guess for me, this is just my opinion, but why would you choose to live somewhere and still um, maybe sort of, uh, but for me, I, I guess I would want to yeah. buy explore. And, and explore, you know, yeah. why would you keep yourself doing the same things that you did before? If yeah. you're choosing to live in another country, does that make sense? I mean, oh, it's totally. Yeah, I think, you know, and it's fair because, you know, there are creature comforts and some people just want to have those creature comforts until they acclimate. Uh, but I think you've you've hit the nail on the head. I think it's very important that that people know that there's uh, the equivalent, if not better, of a product you're accustomed to that's made by a Mexican brand and you're paying probably 50%, sometimes maybe 100% less, um, you know, or at least like you're paying double for the imported brand, whereas you could pay, you know, the local, uh, like sour creams and cheeses exactly. and milks and, yes. and deli meats and cheeses. And, exactly. Uh, so, you know, and bread and all those things. Like, yes, you can get the imported brand, but there's also a very good equivalent Latin brand that's just as good, like you mentioned. It's also cheaper. And you get to explore something new. Like you're you're getting, you're really integrating at that point. Into and so you know what I do? This might help some people, you know, like you said, and you made a valid point. When you're, a, when you first move to a, a foreign country, you do tend to look for some of the familiar products that you're used to. And I could definitely understand that. And I still, you know, I'll give you an example. I like my favorite cereal is still the good old fashioned Kellogg's Corn Flakes, you know, with the mm -hmm. first time. And, oh yes, they have them here too. Um, and I, that is the one reason why I go to Costco <laughs> is to get my Kellogg's Corn Flakes. But, yeah. Um, one thing about Costco, the, the American Costco sold its interests to Mexico and they're there. You don't pay import because they're franchised here. Mm. So that you, you might, that would be my other suggestion. Do a little research. And the, the companies that have American names here, sometimes they are franchised here and then they don't charge the import tax. Yeah. But I think it's kind of important when you are starting out with your budget and trying to grocery shop, for example, that you might research if you see stores with American names um, to see if they ha are charging the import tax or if they have been franchised into Mexico, so they're not charging it. Yeah, that's a great that point. Sense. Yeah, that's... Do like a quick uh, grocery trip without buying anything. Just bring like what those prices are back home and just do a side-by-side -side comparison so you mm -hmm. can get an idea, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you don't even have to go to the grocery store. Most of those grocery stores now have online websites. You can where do it online do it. You can just compare online absolutely yeah it's yeah online. if somebody was to consider moving to Ensenada and they didn't want to have a car what's your and I know this might be difficult because you might drive a lot but um but I'm sure you know like how do you feel that somebody might be able to get around if their Spanish is limited on just like public transportation would they be okay just not having a car in Ensenada oh absolutely they have the little microbus system here and you can, I think it's 30 pesos. Um, and that's for like three or four transfers. I mean, that's not just from point A to point B that's going from several points throughout the city, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just like um, bus systems in the, in the United States, you can buy like a, like a, a monthly, you know, pass or whatever and use it like that and it's cheaper. 
So yeah. yes, it is possible. And they also have Uber here. And um, there are a lot of, of local people who make their living by Uber. Mm -hmm. And again, even that um, system is cheaper here because the cost of living is less. So there's no reason to charge a lot for, and, and because Ensenada is not as huge as, as some other of the, you know, like Tijuana, that's, yeah. you know, an hour and a half to our north, um, it's, it, it's, you can call an Uber and be somewhere in you know, less than 10 minutes usually. So, uh -huh. um, yes, it is possible to get around um, without a car. I do a lot of walking because my, um, where I live is in kind of the center of things here in Ensenada. And between two highways, um, numero tres, which is above me, and numero uno, which is below me, and so um, they, on purpose, the city is sort of planned so that all the the businesses and shopping and everything you would like to or want to do are between those two highways and they're within walking distance of my house. So I can, um, you know, walk over to the bakery or the, mm -hmm. um, or to the pharmacy or to the doctor's office or um, the grocery, there's like three or four different Mexican grocery stores that are within three blocks of my, my house. So great. Yeah. If you didn't, you wouldn't need the car if you didn't want to have it just for your own. If purposes. I didn't want, the only thing I really use it for, to be honest, to, is to go to church hmm. and to go to the, to go, you know, the two hour drive to the border. Mm -hmm. to um, go over to uh, San Diego, you add another 30 minutes to that. So about two and a half hours to the to San Diego if I need medical care or something like that. Mm -hmm. Which is another big reason why people end up moving to Ensenada and sometimes Rosarito um, is because of the proximity to the U.S. So, you know, people might have family back home still, grandchildren, children. Uh, like you, I don't know if your son lives in California, but he actually lives in Canada. But oh, really? Okay, <laughs> because he married a Canadian. He married a Canadian, so oh, got it. But it's easier for them, you know, to fly into um, San Diego, and then I pick him up and bring him across okay. the border in the car, and then we can do things here, and we can do things in San Diego too. So it's you know, um, and also my, fr I, you know, most of my friends that I've known for my lifetime are in California because that's the state I was born and grew up in. So uh, I, th I think part of the reason I rented a, a three bedroom house is to have an extra bedroom yeah. so people could come visit me and have a little vacation in Ensenada, you know, they want. So. Of course. Yeah. And it's a beautiful city for people who have never been there. I mean, it's a really, really beautiful city. Um, it's a huge docking port for a lot of cruise ships. And obviously a lot of uh, commerce and trade comes through there too. Um, I've heard it has some of the best scuba diving in all of Mexico. Mm -hmm, it does. Um, so, you know, it's, it's truly a really, really wonderful city. And it has very dramatic hills that drop into the ocean. And it has that San Diego weather without the San Diego prices. Yes. Um, and the, the, the hills, I mean, at nighttime, I live up on one of the hills. So it's really cool to be out walking at night and I can look down on, on the rest of the city and it just, all the glimmers of lights in the night on the hills and everything, it's it's really pretty. That's awesome. Now, what about healthcare? Um, do you have Mexican healthcare or do you just pay out of pocket whenever something comes up? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. If you can prove that you live um, in every colonia, at least in Ensenada, I can't speak for the rest of Mexico, but Mm -hmm. In Ensenada, every colonia has its own little centro de salud, um, uh, health care center for that mm -hmm. neighborhood. Okay. okay. And um, if you can bring proof that you are a resident of that colonia, then that centro de salud, it doesn't, they don't charge you anything. But um, 
if you're not able to prove you know, that, then of course you do have to pay. I mean, it's, they have to make a living too. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so for th things like, um, if I were to get, you know, I, for example, I have a, um, I've had a problem since I was a child with asthma. And if I were to have some difficulties with my asthma, I could easily go over to the Centro de Salud and, you know, be seen and, and they would treat my asthma and they would do it extremely well. So and, they have specialists of all different kinds going to these centros? Oh yeah, they're, they're, I can see offices of specialists all over Ensenada. That's great. Um, there are, you know, gynecologists, neurologists, you name it, they're here. Um, they would not be free, gratis, <laughs> like the sure. Centro de Salud, they would, they would cost. and. Okay. Uh, for me, it would be better, I think, for me on Medicare to go over to the States for that just because I'm on Medicare. Uh, if I were having to pay out of pocket for the specialists, uh, even here, that would get kind of expensive, to be truthful with you. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. A lot of so people I don't realize. Some, yeah, I pick and choose mm -hmm. um, for the, the just the, the day to day health care. Um, and and it's great here it's it's perfect um but if i needed something special uh like well i i do have a history of stroke i had a stroke about three years ago oh three i'm sorry mm -hmm. and um so i need to see a neurologist once in a while well i just go over to the states for that you know because um it, it my medicare will take care of that and it, it's just uh cost of living wise, it's a little bit, even drive, even having to drive to San Diego for that, it still would be a little cheaper. So, um, but, but as far as just day-to-day -day healthcare, oh my goodness, it's plentiful here. You can, there are pharmacies, most of the pharmacies have a consulting doctor that's in there all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you're sick, you can go in the pharmacy and get your, uh, for, you know, 50 pesos or something, you can get mm -hmm. seen. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll help you pick out the medications that you need should you need any. So I just find that to be um, a wonderful service. and I Without an appointment and without needing exactly. to pull out your insurance card or any of that stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I would, as far as dental care, I would say it's better here, I think. Uh, I get, I don't need to go to the States for that. I do that here. And mm -hmm. I do it very happily. And um, if you're needing uh, mental health care, it's also excellent here. Mm -hmm. There's no need to, to go to the States for that either. If you, well, especially if you speak Spanish, <laughs> it helps to, yeah. to do that. Otherwise, I mean, if you don't and you need a therapist, I, you probably would have to go to the States. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think everything that you would want or need is here, except for um, depending on your health insurance and your and how much money you have to pay for health costs. Um, only specialty care would you need to go to the states for. Yeah, and some people do end up getting you know health insurance in Mexico, and then they end up seeing their specialist um, mm -hmm. there because you know insurance covers it. But you're right for people who are paying fully out of pocket and decide, you know, maybe they have Medicare Advantage and they, or Medicare A and B and then Advantage. And for you, it's simple, right? Like you can drive to San Diego. Yes, absolutely. You don't have to buy an additional ticket or airfare and then, you know, figure all that out. Um, I'm assuming you just have like, you remain, you have a, a residence in California and that's how you're able to con uh, continue using a hospital in California with Medicare. Right. I, you know, I, I noticed that your website tries to help people with um, the details of some of those issues. I think when you're a retired person and you're receiving a pension or Social Security or Medicare, as you pointed out, you need to maintain an address and phone number in the United States or you will you will lose all those benefits of a retired person. And um, and so, um, you know, for me. I've had to learn and I'm still learning, I have to confess, mm -hmm. how to sort of experiment with that a little bit to make sure that I maintain what I need to yeah. um, 
in order to maintain my retirement and my medic medical coverage you know like in ensenada there are businesses i've discovered and i think i'm going to take advantage of this that if you have a mailbox in the united states in chula vista or san ysidro or san diego or even i think they're willing to go all the way to los angeles um you they they provide a service where they will go pick up your mail and your packages and all that for you and bring them back it does cost but sure yeah it's a mail forwarding system yeah and it's i um think you know that's really something to look into and in terms of like telephone most uh, mexican people have a landline still hmm. they have not switched over to being just on the cell and no landline whereas i've noticed i mean i moved here from fresno uh nobody had a landline anymore <laughs> you yeah, know right. using their cell phone but here that's not true so here um, a landline is, is, is still an important uh, part of your lifestyle. So I got a landline and with that, that same company that gave me the landline gave me the internet as well as some free television service. It was part of a package. So that worked out nicely, but, um, uh, an American retiring here would have to explore, okay, how can I maintain uh, telephone service in the uh, in the United States. My service that I happen to have is very expensive, and I'm thinking of switching to something cheaper uh, in the United States. Just you know, like I guess you would call it a throwaway phone. You know, where you just yeah. buy a little bit of minutes, and you have that phone, and so that it's. Um, you can even have a Google Voice phone number, which is exactly. a completely free right. service. Yeah. Yes. And and then you just get then you go ahead and switch your cell phone over to Mexico and it, it mm -hmm. works better. So so that I you know, those kinds of little details, it's just important not to mess with um, the requirements of both countries. The United States requires certain things and Mexico also, as I know you know, requires certain things of me to um, eventually achieve my permanent residency. And so I want to honor both countries. And in order to do that, I, one really has to do their homework and just a plug for, for what you provide. I think what you provide is, is an excellent, um, information, uh, source for people that are considering doing what I'm doing. And I wish I had found you sooner than than already oh. having moved here. <laughs> well, we're connected now, so you can tell other people who are considering moving uh, that we offer this service. But thank you. Yeah, that's the goal: is to help as many people as possible. Try to do it the right way as much as possible, because there's there's a lot of really good free information out there, but there's also a lot of really bad free information out there. Uh, so anyway, not to deviate too much. I'm going to start taking some questions because I see a lot of people uh, have a lot of questions here. And then we're going to get back to some more talking, just you and I, because I, I wanted to make sure we address some of these. But I know we, we also want to talk about, you know, dating in Mexico. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to talk about safety. Uh, you know, do you feel safe? If, have, have you ever not felt safe? And just your experience with that. But I do want to take some questions if you're up for it. Absolutely. Okay, let's see. What do you guys have questions on? How did you go about finding a place to live in Ensenada? We're considering that area. So how did you find your rental? Um, it, there are uh, services here. Uh, you, you need to go on the internet and, and, and just go ask the question of Google, you know, um, are there, uh, what are some uh, sites that would tell me what are what is available to rent or to own in Ensenada? Just ask that question, and it'll come up with a list of sites that you can contact. And um, how can I put this? It's it's not really they're not really real estate agents. They're more um, uh, like house hunters. Well, they're more like 
uh, accountants, contadoras okay. or contadores okay. that, that, um, that work for people that actually own homes here in Ensenada. Like and property they, managers. They use them as agents. They, okay. they call them agents and they, and, but they're not real estate agents. They're yeah. accountants that, that represent the owners and that's who they hook you up with. If you go to one of those sites, they hook you up with these agents, just as long as you realize they're not real estate agents. So if you have real estate questions, um, you might want to use an attorney or something like that to answer some of those questions. But um, I didn't have to do that. I, um, to tell you the truth, I did it. And this is kind of crazy. I just came here. And when I realized I was going to retire, I drove here. And I was staying with a friend. And while I was staying with her, I just started driving it around. And there were, um, you know, it, it, the real estate signs here, they don't look like they do in the States. They're just, uh -huh. they put up a big sign in front of the house with a phone number. And they don't really tell you if it's for rent or for sale. You have to call the number. Right. And so in the process of calling the number, the lady that answered the, the house that I called on, was actually for sale and I, I realized I couldn't do that yet so uh -huh. uh, but she said don't no, don't hang up I can uh, <laughs> hook you up with another one you know that's for rent and she she brought me to this house and that's how I found it yeah I but think I think your prior, advice is perfect yeah prior to that I, I spent I came and stayed with a friend and I spent probably three or four days looking driving around and I also went to those websites on Google that there are different ones. If you go, if you're interested in Ensenada, just how can I find a rental house or a, a purchase house in Ensenada? And they will give you a list and you just do that if you want, or just come here and drive around. To be honest with you, that's what a lot of Americans do. They just yeah. drive around till they see something they like. Because so. there's a lot of locals that have houses for rent that they're not going to publish them online. And they're renting for a very good amount of money, like very low amount of money. You're never going to, I mean, I'm not saying never, but it's rare that you'll find some of those online. Because the cost of them having to like pay somebody to manage them is, online. Is more than they can do. Exactly. This, it doesn't make sense. The house that I found, it didn't even have a sign in front of it. it oh, was, really? It was just sitting here empty and the owner lives in the United States. Um, the family is, are, is a Mexican nationals, but they um, are living there at the moment uh, because he got a job in another city in California. So um, they were just sort of depending on their agent, their contadora, mm -hmm. to help them, you know, find people instead of putting a sign on it. So, yeah. And then she did her job. <laughs> she, <laughs> she found, found them a person. <laughs> <laughs> but we, I agree with that. I think you're, you're absolutely right, Kathy. We also recommend people and, you know, and there's many reasons for it. You can only see so much online. It's a totally different experience when you're actually there. You have to come wherever you want to live. You need to go there and drive around. To absolutely. Absolutely. That way you can see which neighborhoods you like. Like if it's really important for you to be by a grocery store, because maybe you don't want to have a car. And you can you know that ahead of time and not the online listing isn't going to tell you that. And, you know, you can only do so much homework on Google Maps. Um, so I definitely agree with you that, that just driving around if you obviously have a car. But if you don't, then, you know, we have a list of people that you can hire to drive you around that will show you mm -hmm. rentals in your budget. Um, Somebody wants to know how how do they find community in an area, you know, with all the locals. She's working on her Spanish, but it's hard when she doesn't use it. So maybe maybe you can share some insight. Did you know a lot of Spanish when you first um, started coming to Ensenada? 15 years ago, no. I didn't know a word of Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, and 15 years ago, I kind of, I got taken advantage of. That's how I came to come here. I came here to help somebody who ended up leaving, you know, kind of abandoning me here. And so I ended up um, in one of those American gated communities for a little while. Okay. And, and uh, that was 15 years ago. And I made a few friends there. And as I was there, I realized, I think that's when I started learning how isolated I truly was. 
uh, mm -hmm. still, even living in the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I, you know, and I needed to work on that Spanish. So, um, uh, when I, one day I was walking on the beach and I met this woman and she was there with all of her grown children and her grandchildren. She was about my age at that time. And, and so we didn't speak each other's language, but she handed me her phone number, which I recognized as a local phone number. And even though it was hard, I did call her and we started trying to form a friendship without speaking each other's language. Wow. And eventually she lived in a, um, she lived farther up in the hills here in Ensenada and, and her house is like a compound. And so it has a lot of houses on the property. And yeah. so she had one of those vacant and I ended up living there. And uh, while I was here during those two and a half years and I, uh, when it came open, I rented from her and I living with her family, I ended up learning Spanish. I was immersed in it. Really? No neighbors or anything around me yeah. spoke English. So yeah. I really had no choice. It was, it was do or die, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever it was so to survive. <laughs> I ended up, you know, learning Spanish. And um, so the person, the questioner, uh, you know, you need to, to force yourself to live in the middle of the city so you can practice the Spanish you do have. I agree. Um, it, it's, I know it's tempting to go where the language is familiar, but ultimately, if you really want to keep uh, practicing that Spanish that you, it sounds like you already have, um, choose somewhere in the middle of, of things, not off in a private American separated community. Um, I, I, you know, from my perspective, um, if I need the fellowship with other Americans, um, one of the places I can get it is on an, online. There's a, a, a Facebook group mm -hmm. called Ensenada Expats. Mm -hmm. And I talk to people on there all the time and I've, I've made a couple of friends and one of them I've invited over to have coffee with me. And she lives out in Punta Banda, which is one of the American communities quite far from here. It's mm. a good few miles south of Ensenada. Um, and she's interested in moving into the city. She, she says it's too expensive out there and she's trying to, to be brave enough to come in here and her Spanish, she says, is spotty as well. And so I told her, well, let's make friends and I'll introduce you around and, and I'll help you with your Spanish too. Oh, so, nice. you know, you, if you can find other Americans who speak Spanish, um, let them kind of gradually help you learn, you know, the language and introduce you to the local community. And um, eventually you can put down roots in a way that that's more, that's less isolated and it's more part Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's so nice I, of you. That's very, that's, you probably made the difference in that lady's. You know, I find of uh, in church, I go to a local church here. Not it's a Spanish speaking church, but the good thing about me being in that church is that a lot of people in the church want to learn English. And some, of, you know, it was the um, it was the church I went to when I was here before. And um, and now, you know, after all this time of knowing them and spending time with them, some of them are starting to learn English. And <coughs> so. Um, it's been a mutually beneficial relationship because now I can teach them. I'm teaching them English and they're teaching me more Spanish and they practice on me and, and I practice my Spanish on them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, um, so church is a good place to do that. It, it's just, you know, again, it helps if you already have some Spanish, but yeah, I think I would encourage people if you do have even a little bit of Spanish, be brave and jump in with that and don't, don't yeah. hesitate. That's the, that's the best way to, to learn the language is not in a classroom, but in La Calle, in the street yeah. the with the people, you know, that's the, way, that's the best place to learn it. And, and that's how you build community. If you, if you have the language, you can build the community. 
Yeah. And the nice thing is because of the way that Mexico's built, like you mentioned that there's not a lot of zoning laws, you'll probably always go to the same bakery. You'll always go to the same grocery. You'll always go to, so you start meeting the same people over and over again, right? That either like serve you your bread or give you your, or bag your groceries or, you know, yeah, things um, like that. I, um, I have a butcher that I go to, mm -hmm. a carniceria and, and the, his name is Mendoza. Mm -hmm. And, um, He's been, I've known him for 15 years now. And, and I wouldn't think of going, even though he's not in my colonia, I wouldn't think of going anywhere else because we're friends, right? Yeah. And I have a gas station I go to and, and the lady that pumps my gas and, and helps me there, her name is Carolina. And she's my friend too. And, um, you know, I have these connections all over town. Yeah. It, means, it does mean like you just said, you have to go to the same place repeatedly and and they will um one thing i love about the mexican culture is is how wonderfully friendly they are and how wonderful they remember your name yeah they consider it like if you repeat if you are a repeat customer even one time well, <laughs> they embrace you and you're part of the family you know yeah. and, and so you, you don't have to worry too much about building community if you Within the Mexican culture, the focus is on the community. So okay. building community, if you're willing to live in the midst of the community, is not an issue, I promise. I so. agree. Yeah. Neighbors neighbors want to know who lived next to them and they'll yes, do they anything do. to make chit-chat and just find out about you and everything. And I mean, they're genuinely interested, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, in the U.S., it's more like everybody kind of stays. In it's their private. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was here two days and I, I already know my uh, Patty and Dolores on this side and Linda on that side and Jorge yeah. across the street. I mean... I think it took me months before I had that many names when I ever I had neighbors in the United States. <laughs> you know, yeah. So. yeah, but I would agree. And I think, uh, Chris, you were asking that question. I would agree with everything that Kathy has to say. I think just keep on practicing your Spanish. Don't be afraid to practice with a local. If you mess up, it's okay. They're not going to give you you know, stink eye, they're probably just they'll be like, well, excuse me, like, what did you try to say? They um, might even correct you, but in a, such a nice way. Yeah. Along with a compliment of how good it is that you're trying so hard to speak Spanish. You know? And they'll probably want to practice their English with you. So mm -hmm. it'll be a very beneficial mutual win-win. Um, how about somebody wants to know, you you shared that somebody took advantage of you and you didn't know any better, but you know, any tips would love to hear warnings about avoiding frauds from expats and locals. Any, any other stories that you've heard from friends or from yourself uh, personally on how to avoid some of these fraudsters or scams? Okay. One of the biggest ones that is going on in Ensenada right now. Okay. Um, has to do with, when you're driving around town. Okay. Um, and so, and, and not to be insulting or anything, but at, at all, but um, driving in Mexico is way different than driving in the United States. Absolutely. Right? Oh yes. We have signals. They're called semaphoros <laughs> and um, you know, red and green and yellow, just like in the States, but honoring and paying attention to them, is not quite as important here as it is there. Okay. So people drive a little bit like bullies around here. And um, one of my, one of my local friends, she says they drive like burros. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just, you know, her term for it. I would just say they a little bit aggressive. That's what I yeah. would say. And so because of the aggressive driving habits um, in this country versus our, you know, our United States, um, it is easier for these scam artists to do what they frequently do here in Ensenada is if they see an American car with American plates and they know that you're not used to their aggressive driving, they will try to corner you, especially if you're driving in the right lane, they will and you're driving cautiously, they will cut you off. And then uh, one of them, another one will pull up next to you. 
and they'll trap you in so that the only way you can, you know, move at all is to hit one of them. And um, then they will sue you for every penny they can get since you're an American. And I've had mm. it a lot of expats here have experienced that. Scam. Oh, man. Yeah. And um, it is, what do they call it? I can't remember. The, um, it's like trampa chokes or something. Is something Yeah, that makes sense. Like a it trick, a, a crash they, trick. A crash trick, yeah. And so um, sometimes they'll wait until they know you're going to hit them and then cut you off in, in front of you. And then you hit, you hit them and the, the person that is alongside of you is part of it and they got you trapped. So, and then they sue you and it doesn't matter if you have insurance, they'll, they'll try to get whatever they can get. So uh, that is what you heard of, of that happening to people that, you know, mm -hmm. oh man, that's yeah, unfortunate. It's actually right now in Ensenada, it's one of the big scams there. Man, that's unfortunate. If you, if you look it up on the internet, it's one of the ones that they're trying to warn Americans about who live here. Yeah. So, so maybe, maybe a good tip would be before you start driving in Mexico, maybe just spend some time with somebody that's local in their car and see what kind of the, the unspoken rules are. Yes. Get in your car. I'm willing to drive people around so they can understand kind of the unwritten rules of driving in Mexico. It's a little different and um, it doesn't help that the roads are not, the potholes never get fixed and um, that many roads are unpaved here. Yeah. So like if in the, in the middle of Ensenada, they're paved, but if you go up in the hills, they're not. So um, that even adds to the, the scammers um, ability to take advantage of you because if you slow down for a pothole, <laughs> yeah, know, then they'll be like, Oh, this opportunity. It's an so, outsider for sure. Yeah. So um so the, that's the scam I know about in terms of, of uh, what, one that is current that is going on right now. And so, you know, um, one way to avoid it for me is to drive in the left lane. And then mm. the, only, the only way they could trap me uh, is if I'm, I'm up against a concrete divider and that's impossible for them to, to do. So Good point. I, I stay in the left lane and I, and if I'm on a road that has really bad potholes, uh, I will drive, I will even drive on the other side of the street if that's what it takes to not have to slow down for the potholes because I know how those trappers are. They will get, they will scheme you in. And I, I don't really want to be a victim of that. I know that other people here have, so. And the other might be to have a Mexican license plate as opposed to a foreign plated car that just like at least masks you a little bit more. That's true. Um, but again, there are some, and you probably know this better than me, there are some residency requirements for me to get. Correct. There. Yes. So yes. for the time. You to be a resident. <laughs> yeah. I, I, for the time that I'm, I have to be stuck with the American plates, I will definitely be, have my eyes wide open with, with that kind of a scam going on yeah a lot <laughs> yeah yeah of course and that's another reason why you need to be aware of your surroundings i mean not only in mexico everywhere but obviously if you're if you know about these things that kathy's sharing and you're in some other driving and you, you know another thing i would want to caution people okay if you're um wanting to rent a house here mm -hmm. um, another scam that can sometimes happen in the process of renting a house is if you don't um, you know, whereas there are tenant landlord laws in the United States, there aren't those laws here. So and they don't necessarily put on the contract for renting um, that there's a 30 day, you know, they that you need 30 days notice or they need to give you 30 mm -hmm. days if you're, you know, if they want you out because they sold the house or something. OK. And so consequently, there's another scam where they rent it to you. And then if that's not in the contract, um, they collect your money and then they, they leave you without a place to live because they then rent it to somebody else or sell it or just take yeah. your money don't let you in. Okay. So I made sure I knew, I think I knew about that ahead of time, just from, from the advantage of having lived here, you know, 15 years ago. So I made sure that my contract said, um, 
it isn't just 30 days notice that I give you if I'm going to move. I need 30 days notice from you if mm. you want to sell the house. Yeah. So they can't take your month's rent and then be right. Like, so they that's a scam too, and it, uh -huh. it they do it. It's it's trust me. Been done. I've heard of it being done. I've I've read accounts of it uh, from even from my Facebook group, uh, Ensenada Expats. So I know people do it. So it's another thing to watch out for. Um, yeah. And really, those are the only things I know about. I don't. Um, I can't, I, I really can't, you know, I, there, there aren't the kinds of scam artists here in my observation that there are in the United States. They are here, but there's just, it's, you know, the scam artist that, that took advantage of me 15 years ago was an American. Yeah. And she wasn't a native or local Mexican at all. So um, yes, there are scam artists here, but it's not anywhere near the proliferation that it is in the United States. So the one or two that I named, those if you're if they know you're an American, those might be ones that they'll try to take advantage of you. Otherwise, I don't I really don't I can't identify any others. Yeah. If you know some, let me know. <laughs> Which is a good reason why it's also maybe a, a good idea, even when you're trying to build community, to not overshare too much about, mm -hmm. you know, what your income is or what your you know, things about, you know, what you're bringing or, I mean, just, you know, as, as, as until you start meeting people more in depth and you start understanding what, you know, their true motivations are, even at church, right? Like some people can give you the sob story about how their family doesn't have X, Y, Z, and they have a medical procedure coming up. And then next thing you know, it, you're writing them a check for X amount of money. So just, you know, I would say, for anybody watching, just be wary, right? You're building community, be friendly, but also just keep in mind how much you share right away. Um, Cause you never know what people's intentions are right away. So, thank you. I will say that um, if anybody's watching and you wanna know how to avoid people who might not be trustworthy, we do have a directory of contacts across Mexico that we have vetted. They are trustworthy. They don't do any of these things that we're talking about. We have realtors, immigration yeah. facilitators, yeah. Uh, international moving companies, mail forwarders. So anyway, long story short, we have those contacts for you so that you know we can help you avoid some of those frustrations down the road. Um, somebody has some more questions. Kathy, and I know we're coming up on, actually, we're over the hour, so I want to be mindful of your time, too, because I know I told well, you no, that. I'm, I'm retired. I'm fancy free. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <In> the obligations. <laughs> That's awesome. We can we can help some of, uh, some more people reach their retirement goals with these, uh, with these chats. Um, let's see. Let's, let's see some more comments that you guys have. Somebody's a big fan of Baja's uh, gobernadora, Marina del Pilar. Apparently, she's moving that state forward. What do you feel about that? Do you feel like the state is is moving forward? Um, the state of Baja? Yeah. Moving forward in what way? I don't know. They just mentioned that they're a huge fan of uh, Marina del Pilar. Somebody uh, said that they love the beach, but they can't handle the humidity um, or her husband cannot handle the humidity. So maybe this would be a great time to talk about the weather. And sure. well, um, if you if your husband cannot handle the humidity, you don't then you don't want to move to Acapulco or Puerto <laughs> Vallarta yeah. or any of uh, Playa del Carmen or any of those because right. part of Mexico is extremely extremely humid okay yes. and the the weather in ensenada is more like san francisco it's foggy and the fog keeps the temperatures cool even in the summer and humidity i no not here it's dry here this is this is mexico dry country here mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> um, uh, this is this is dry country um humidity is not an issue in ensenada uh, if you you know, if you are not a fan of of having the fog roll in once in a while, then maybe it's not for you. But right. I'm up. Uh, you have to remember, Yen Ensenada is hilly, and I'm up 
up on the hill further up. So when the fog rolls in down in the cent zona um, central, it's it may I may be in the sunshine up here. So it just depends um, part what part of Ensenada you live in. Um, yeah, good point. So the weather here is is um, nice all the time. I like today. I think we're in the 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 high sixties, maybe sixty eight, sixty nine which is normal for April. Uh -huh. um, in the summer, uh, maybe in July and August, you might get a 90 degree day here. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't feel 90. And that's mainly because you have the ocean right next to you. So it feels the real feel of the day is maybe 85 or 83, something like that. You don't really need air conditioning. Nobody has one. Um, in fact, the fact that I have one in my car is a talking point for a lot of uh, Mexican <laughs> locals because they don't have them <laughs> in their yeah. cars. Yeah. So, um, um, you know, I have a, a Toyota RAV4 and, and on a, I don't recommend bringing such a fancy car into this country because it, it becomes the focus of attention. And like I was saying earlier, the folk, you know, the, the greater possibility of, of scams for, mm -hmm. for things like that. So, but um, you don't need, the, the only thing is it does get a little cold in December and January and the night. Yeah. And they don't have, you know, natural gas running into the houses here. And that's just not part of, of this country. So if you did want a heater, you have to buy a little mina de gas and you attach it to one of your, like a portable heater that you can wheel around the house. Um, I haven't needed, I, you know, when I lived here um, 15 years ago, I just wore a lot of clothes in December. Yeah. <laughs> I sat on a couple layers and I didn't really need any, anything else. And, um, and I, you know, I've been, I moved in here in February and it was you know, a little nippy mm -hmm. and I wore a sweater. I didn't, I don't have any, you know, need for that kind of heat really. So what about bugs? Bugs. Bugs. Well, um, we have the same bugs here, spiders and cockroaches and ants and, you know, um, and they have exterminators here too, if, if that becomes an issue, but yeah. yeah. If you keep your house clean, it, it, I think that if you've heard tales in the United States about bugs and insects here, I think that that's, those are not true. If, if you keep your place clean, you're not going to have an issue with bugs any more than you would in the United States. That's just my. Your experience. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe somebody who has a lot of dogs or cats and they're leaving the constant, you know, I have cats. Or, or you have cats, okay. Have cats, no right? bugs that come in with your cats. No. Yeah. Um, particularly mosquitoes, because I know that that's like one of the recommended shots for people moving to Mexico is... Um, Malaria or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there are mosquitoes, but um, most people that I see and I myself deal with them by spraying myself if I know I'm going to go somewhere where there's a lot of standing water that's not moving. Yeah. Not the ocean, for example, but rather. Right. Like no, pond not the or, ocean, yeah. but, but there are places that have ponds here. And, um, well, like if you, if you go out to the wine country, there are arroyos that have some standing water, you know, that's not moving. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would probably, if you know you're going to be near that, I would spray myself otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense, obviously. But it is something that uh, we do recommend if you are moving to Mexico and you don't have uh, your shots up to date. Um, you know, dengue is another one that we, we do hear some people get, and it can, it can really, really make you sick. So, all right, I'm going to take just a few more questions because I definitely want to be mindful of Kathy's time, although I'm very, very thankful for you, Kathy, for sharing all this knowledge with all of us, not only me, but the rest of the people that are actually watching this. And I think you're helping a lot of people. So thank It's you. my pleasure. 
Um, join us. Good, good. Somebody wants to know, what about your internet speed? Yeah, I agree. Your internet speed looks, and you know, your video is amazing. So what about your internet? Well, I'm glad that you asked me that because I'll be honest with you. I am um, with all of you in the audience. Uh, we, uh, Mariana and I, we, I had an original date of what was it, April 7th, and wow. I was ill, and I broke my thumb, <laughs> and I, I wasn't able to, to keep that. So um, um, I was, I remember being concerned when she said how we were going to do this about the internet, because the colonia I live in, in Ensenada, does not yet have fiber optic and when I went to Telnor, which is the the the, the Baja branch of the of the main Mexican telephone company, I you know they they are able to look you up on their grid and okay. tell you exactly what your internet speed is. And I had the lowest, and I was thinking, oh no, how are we ever going to do this? You know. Well, last week I got an email from Telnor saying that um, fiber optic and internet was coming to my neighborhood. Oh, nice. And then last, today's Thursday, right? So last Friday, I got an inter, uh, another email saying they would be coming on this coming Tuesday. Well, actually it was Wednesday morning in the middle of the night. Um, and to install the fiber optic. And they did. And now, as you see, the quality is quite good. And yeah, the quality is excellent. Instead of the lowest speed, now because of the fiber optic, I have uh, a high speed internet. And I'm very pleased with that. I actually, I'll tell you how high the speed is. Okay. I have, okay. Right now, I have my phone hooked up to it. Uh, behind me, this cabinet here uh -huh. is a, um, desktop i have i'm on my laptop my television right now is connected to um the internet on the smart tv and i get uh you know everything netflix and disney plus and all these other things sure. um and so you know before last this past tuesday i could only run one thing if i one was device yeah. my phone, then I couldn't get the laptop to, to hook up, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. My desktop was okay because it's directly connected to the internet. So, but the television internet didn't work either. So I had to only do one thing at a time if I was going to enjoy the internet in my house. And now it's just like it was when I was in the States. I can run them all and I'm not having any problems. So, uh, I want to great. tell everybody that not all of Mexico has fast internet, okay? Correct. And, and even in the same city, not all of Ensenada has so hyper optic. Ensenada, yeah. Ensenada is, you, when you go um, to, you always, when well, you get your internet service through the telephone company here, that's how it is distributed. So, uh, when you go get your your phone they will talk to you about your internet and they will you will tell them your address and they will look it up and they will tell you what speed you're eligible for mm -hmm. and you can either buy that if it's if it's up to the highest or if it, if you don't have that we're kind of stuck with whatever it's whatever available. they tell you is available exactly mm -hmm. i'm thinking in spanish so some of my hesitating is because <laughs> I want to say it in Spanish. And I have That's to. great. <laughs> um, so uh, definitely check it out when you're when you're first moving here and you go get your phone. Talk to the phone company and ask them to tell you. They will look it up for you. You don't have to do it. Uh, what your internet speed is for your address. And they'll what, tell you. 
what's the price difference from what you were paying before to now with uh with this okay, i was my the lowest internet speed is 300 pesos okay that's 15 dollars. okay mm -hmm. and then if you um want a higher speed it they will tell you the speeds that you can get, and then they will tell you what it costs. So what I did was I bought the speed that at the time I was eligible for. Okay. And now what I told them was, was I really want the high speed internet and I'm willing to pay for it, but I'm not going to pay for it if I can't get it, you know? Yeah. So what they did is they said, okay, well, we'll tell you what we'll do. We'll make a note on your account. And when you get the high speed in your neighborhood, because they did tell me when in February that in Sonata, there were certain colonias that were in the process of getting fiber optics. And I was like, oh, cool. Okay. And they told me that mine was one of them because of how close it is to the center of town. So mm. uh, they did. Uh, I noticed that my new, my, my town or bill that I that is due on May seventh uh, or eighth, I think, is um, seven hundred pesos now instead of three hundred. So um, again, dollars. That's about thirty five dollars. And for you folks listening from the states, yes, that is still way cheaper than way whatever. cheaper <laughs> than any fiber optic. But, but to to the locals that live here, uh, a lot of them won't don't want to pay they don't yeah. have 700 pesos yeah so they opt for the low list internet you know that that they they can afford which is usually that 300 pesos about 15 dollars. but i said that because i actually want to supplement my income with mm -hmm. a little bit of part-time work on the internet um yeah i would rather have the high speed so that I can do that. Of and course. So very happy to supply that for me. And and they did tell me that it was coming and by golly, here it is now. And just just three days ago I finally got the fiber optic and now I have this great connection. So you're gonna be browsing the internet, watching a TV show while oh, having yeah, your phone, be. play music <laughs> all at the same time. <laughs> um I have one more question, and I think this one is for you know the ladies that are moving to Mexico as a single woman. Um, what about dating? Is that something you've explored? You're you're widowed. You're now single. Is that something you've explored in Mexico? And if you have, would you mind sharing with any any people um, out there? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm going to be 67 in August, so it's not like I'm. Uh, into the party scene or the dating scene as sure. I went, you know, a long time ago was, but um, I have certainly taken it upon myself to ask questions about that, especially at my church. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to be honest, um, because there is a man, a single man, my age who lives across the street from me. Oh, okay. Uh, he lives with his two sisters and um, I, uh, you know, he has come across and, and talked to me several times and, and shown a bit of an interest. And he's I, flirted. he's definitely yeah, flirted. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I, um, you know, before I plunge into anything like that, I, I want to be aware of cultural differences mm -hmm. and uh, what that would look like an American woman, a Mexican man, you know, in a mm -hmm. relationship. Um, because, uh, he's, uh, he's, you know, I'm, I'm an independent woman. I, I have certain ideas about what it means to be a woman mm -hmm. in a relationship. And I, I, uh, I am a, very aware just from the women that I talk to in my church, that those ideas are quite different than what they have about what it's like to be in a relationship you know, with some, with a man. Uh -huh. So I'm taking it quite slowly. And, um, and I think I'm just going to develop a friendship with him as a neighbor. Uh -huh. And then, you know, try to be, be honest and, and let him know that because of the culture I come from, you know, I am 
not going to be probably the kind of woman that will, you know, part of the, the cultural difference, I'll just come right out and say, sure. the women that I, um, that are in my church, for example, to them, it's just part of being in the relationship with a man that you wait on him a lot. And that mm -hmm. he does he expects okay. that too. And, and again, I'm not, I don't want to portray that to people as, okay, you're like a slave to the guy. Because <laughs> that's not it's true. a cultural thing. Sure, it's just a yeah. cultural thing. It's just the way they um, see they're they're getting along together. Mm -hmm. And I, it would take I, I have to be honest for me to turn into that kind of a, a person. I don't know if I could. I come from another culture, and uh, yes, I can recall when I, you know, when I I was got married in 1976 and um you know and that was the culture then my husband and i were um you know we kind of shared a lot of household responsibilities but when when i gave birth to our son you know that was kind of on me and and mm -hmm. and i understood that to be my role you know mm -hmm. and uh but we shared, you know, cooking and we shared some of the housework and stuff like that. And uh, I, um, it's not quite as well shared in this culture. And again, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that for me, I would, it would be hard for me to change mm -hmm. who I am right down to my core. Yeah. So I would say um, in terms of those kinds of relationships, it would be, it would not be good to just jump into something unless you want to really, and you are open to changing yourself kind of completely. Um, or if I, that's discussed at the very beginning and it's something that you're both on the same page about, right? About, exactly. That it's and not going to happen if that's not who you are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, um, I'm very open to, um, to being, to not spending the rest of my life by myself and to finding someone with whom I could share the rest of my life with. But yeah. I will, I will go into that openness with a good bit of caution because I am in another culture and I want to respect the culture that I'm in, but I also want to respect the person that I am having come, having had my roots in another culture. So yeah. I hope I that answers some of that a little bit. I, you know, I think so. I, I was just wondering, you know, if there was anything that maybe you had learned um, in in the dating world, right? And it sounds like you have. I mean, it sounds like you've talked to a lot of people who are in relationships and in relationships with Mexican men, and um, and you know, I even though that may be a cultural thing, also based on age, I do think that it is very much a cultural thing. And the thing that I can tell you, I was raised even, even, you know, being born in like the eighties, um, still raised that way that, you know, mm -hmm. oh, you know, you make sure like, this was something that they told me a lot when I was little, they were like, you better make sure you marry somebody that will like increase your, your lifestyle or your livelihood of lifestyle. Cause that was just so ingrained into, uh, women's heads. And it's like kind of putting out the idea that you're not going to be able to do it on your own. Um, yes. Which, and, you know, we've proven, we've proven people wrong. <laughs> and I know in my church, because I go to a church in, uh, where there are no Americans, I'm the only one, um, they are, they look at me and they go, well, you shouldn't, you need to find somebody. You can't, you know, keep yeah. living by yourself like this. And I'm like, okay, um, just remember that I'm coming from another culture and I can't really plunge into that with someone from here without running into s some immediate um, friction. Conflicts. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you, you know, part of the activity of a church is to pray. If you want to pray for that for me, go ahead and yeah. we'll see what happens. You know, like, like, I know. just don't <laughs> think it's something I can rush into. And I, I actually told a lot of them, I don't want you all trying to match make for me. That's good. <laughs> yeah, that can be annoying too, to just be like, 
<laughs> be matched behind your back in a way. Um, thank you. I know that's all. That's very personal, and I appreciate you sharing that because I do think that it's not talked about a lot. Um, and I think it just depends on every individual person's character, right? It's the same for a man. If an American man wants to marry a or get together with a Latin woman, there are cultural differences there too. Um, so just keep that in mind, right? Like there, there may be things that you're not used to. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Kathy. Not a problem. Well, um, I want to I want to give you guys another chance to ask any last minute questions. I love the relationship advice. Somebody says, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing that. I knew some people would be very interested in that. Um, somebody says, I missed the part where you have an address in the USA in case of medical needs. Uh, she's talking about Medicare Advantage. So mm -hmm. very specifically to Medicare Advantage and making sure that you have an address in the US. Um, and choosing your address wisely in the U.S. because you're going to be given a hospital designation based on your address. So you want to make sure you, uh, you, you look into that before giving. Um, exactly. Like, for example, I moved here from Fresno, California, which is in northern California. And oh. it's in the county of Fresno. And I do not wish to drive all the way back there. <laughs> To get my Medicare needs met. So I, one of the things about Medicare or Medi-Cal or anything that's government insurance, if you change counties, you have to, you know, completely redo everything and it, it has to be in the county that, you know, so yeah. I, I have to admit, I have not yet done, switched my Medicare to San Diego County. So that is something I have to do and um it is very important and yeah. so you choose that you then choose your house address according to that county so um i would suggest if you know somebody in the in the city or the county that would be the best option uh -huh. but if they won't allow you to send your mail there unless it's in care of well then you really need your own number so another way to do that don't use a P.O. box because they won't put Correct. The they won't allow it. So you have to go to a place like United Parcel Service stores that, or Mailboxes, Inc. or something like that that actually gives you a street address with a number. And um, you can put that on your driver's license. You can use that as your American address and you can make your switch with Medicare with that. Mm -hmm. That yeah. is that is what I would recommend. Um, and uh, in terms of even your United States passport, uh, which is absolutely vital to have here with the visa, appropriate visa attached, of course, uh -huh. that, that when you make your passport um, renewals, that you do the same thing. You, you must have that solid um, address and not in care of somebody else. So if you do use somebody else's, a friend's, you, they need to give you permission to use it as if it was your own home. And uh, many people won't do that. So yeah, it's kind of a weird thing to ask in a way. Yeah. But, but there are services out there that will give you an address, like you mentioned. Uh, the UPS store is another one that will give you an actual street address and you have a mailbox. Now, the thing is, if you do start collecting a lot of junk mail there, they will not um, throw it away for you. So. No, they won't. And yeah. and so uh, that's where that service that I was telling you about, I think, before we came on the air. Correct. Is, there is a service here in Ensenada where people, and this is how they make their living, and they are they have their little passport card so they can do that. They'll go across the border for you and get, pick up your mail and packages and clean out your mailbox for you and bring it back. And, yeah, um, it's a good service. They, they will do that, and it's it's a very reputable service. They are licensed to perform that business. It's not just some stranger doing it. So, yeah. um, it's something to look into as well. So, yeah, all good advice. Well, if you guys have any more of the questions, I'm sure we already covered them. So, feel free to watch the replay. If you joined us a little late, this is recorded. It'll be available on the website. Oh, one other tip. I just oh yes, it. please. Okay, a lot of you are accustomed to. Um, having your TV uh, streaming services, right? 
And as some of you may know, um, some of them you cannot stream in Mexico. Uh, in fact, Netflix and I think Disney Plus are the only ones I'm aware of. Maybe HBO Max, but you can stream here. Okay. But the rest of them are not. So what you need to do, and it only costs like two bucks a month, is purchase a, a VPN. And um, it, without getting into too much technical detail, your computer has an IPN, which is an address um, that your computer has unique to it. Your television has an address unique to it. Your smart TV does as well. And it's, and um, the VPN, if it shows Mexico, then none of the programming you're used to is going to come into your TV. Uh -huh. So what you want to do is buy a VPN from the United States. And it only costs two bucks a month and it's worth it because you can have all your familiar programming and in English, you know, you know, if you do Netflix here, you can do it, but you will have to change the language. Uh, and sometimes that's not possible. And so you'll have um, the English script on the bottom, but it's, you're going to hear it in Spanish. So anyway, yeah. just a tip. If you yeah, want great tip. programming to come to you, your television programming, streaming services to come to you in English for a measly two bucks a month, um, you can get another VPN uh, address for your TV. So it's a great tip. Yeah. And in fact, you when you do Google searches without a VPN in Mexico, a lot of your searches will come up based on where your location is. So a VPN exactly. allows you to also have location uh, search results in for, English and in for a, the U.S. Exactly. Right? exactly. If that's what you're trying to search is something in English or in the U.S. So yes, great advice. I agree with that. Um, I want to tell you guys about the next live stream uh, next Thursday, April 28th at 5 p.m. We're going to have a lady named Janine who's a blogger and she's lived all over Mexico but has spent a lot of time in Jalapa, Veracruz, um, which doesn't get talked about a lot. Would you agree, Kathy? I agree. I know yeah. people live in Veracruz and I would love to visit there sometime, but it's not like a destination for kind of like i mean ensenada maybe is more actually of a destination of course, yeah. moving than veracruz even but yeah yeah and it's you know it's a higher elevation it's like five thousand feet mm -hmm. above sea level has a pretty temperate weather year round although a lot more humid than ensenada um but anyway it's a it very low cost of living if you're willing to not be surrounded by obviously a lot of expats or english-speaking people um, and if you just want to be immersed more in what we're talking about, this like local Mexican culture, Veracruz also has some of the best food in all of Mexico mm -hmm, uh, sure. and a lot of really good music and a lot of folklore. So we're going to be talking to Janine next week at 5 p.m. Um, Central. So make sure you if you haven't joined the newsletter, go to MexicoRelocationGuide.com forward slash newsletter. Join it. That's exactly how you're going to find out about all these future live streams. Or if you're subscribed to this YouTube channel, I always post about our future live streams there. So I want to thank you guys all for joining me today. And I want to especially thank Kathy for sharing a lot about your experience and your life and your tips and advice. So thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. And um, I will see you guys all next week. So hasta luego.